Um, averaging presenting in small area estimates not only on poverty but as well as other social indicators produced by the Philippine statistical system for evidence-based policy making better targeted and for better targeted and focused programs. So my presentation My presentation will cover the following. Um, basically, first, what do we want to achieve out of this presentation or out of this um, gathering uh, from the perspective of an official statistician? And then secondly, um, efforts of the Philippine statistical system in the generation of small area estimates. Third would be small area estimates focusing mainly on poverty. And fourth would be some policy or program implications. And lastly, the challenges and opportunities to the Philippine statistical system as well as to uh, policy makers and decision makers. So first, what do you want to achieve? Um, for us, official statisticians in the Philippine statistical system, we of course want to generate high quality official statistics at lower levels of disaggregation for better targeted and focused programs. Like, for example, before um, years back, we were only producing national, regional estimates uh, for major indicators, for example, on poverty, but demands have become increasing such that now, even at the provincial level, it, it is deemed that city municipal level disaggregation of poverty is more relevant for better targeted programs. And then of course the challenge, or at least after achieving the production or generation of lower level estimates of uh, social and economic indicators, we would like the policy and decision makers to use high quality official statistics for evidence-based policy making. We always say that the, the, uh, the responsibility doesn't stop at the generation part, but also it is most relevant when these are seen as actual policy uses. And then lastly, I think both the producers and users of these statistics have a common goal for better development outcomes when we generate this, when we use this, for the MDGs in 2015 and even the post-2015 um, MDG framework. So just to give you some, just a background on the efforts of the Philippine statistical system in the generation of small area estimates. I have met, as I have mentioned before, uh, the demands for statistics has been increasing exponentially in more, in more recent years. And more, in fact, more statistics and indicator systems are needed to address new and emerging concerns, such as the following, good governance and anti-corruption, millennium development goals at the sub-national monitoring is most essential, child poverty and disparities, climate change, measures of well-being, progress of societies. This is often, often said that we should go beyond traditional measures or conventional measures of progress of societies but would, should in fact cover other um, dimensions of progress, even subjective measures of progress. And hunger index, child and gender related development indices, among others. So to address these demands and to keep pace with our competitors in the third millennium, there's a strong need to rethink the relevance of traditional statistics and statisticians to be able to address the information needs of emerging concerns. We always believe that in the Philippine statistical system, particularly in the NSCB, uh, our guiding principle in the generation production of statistics is relevance. Uh, out of the many demands for, for statistics, we always ask uh, how, how relevant is it for evidence-based policy making? For example, we cannot just continue on producing statistics that are just good to know or interesting to know, but eventually you would not like statistics that are really relevant for actual policy uses. Hence, this should be useful to society. And of course, with the growing demand for statistics also come the growing demand for lower levels of statistics. And when we talk of lower levels, when we talk of smaller areas of estimates, uh, this does not talk only of geographic disaggregation because as I mentioned before, national, regional, provincial, and now we're going down to even city and municipal level. And not to forget, we are, we are also being requested to have congressional district 
uh, level estimates because funds are also and resources are also provided at the congressional level. Hence, evi for evidence-based policy making, um, estimates even at the congressional district level is also needed. So when we talk of small areas, we do not only cover geographic disaggregation, but also equally important, we should also cover sectoral concerns or sectoral disaggregation. For example, children, women, senior citizens, farmers, fisher folks, or other basic sectors as identified in the society. So this next two slides just present to you, just gives you a listing of some examples or some PSS efforts uh, to produce um, smaller area estimates for economic statistical frameworks and indicator systems for social as well as other multi-sectoral. For example, for economic statistics, uh, aside from the core national account, satellite accounts have been have been produced at the sectoral level, for example, for tourism, health, education, and even women's contribution to the economy. And at the geographic level, there were also initial efforts to come up with provincial product accounts for two pilot areas, specifically for Palawan and Guimaras. Well, there were efforts before to or at least some interest have been, have been signified by some cities, for example, Makati City, Quezon City, and an area in Papanga, I believe. This was not um, uh, realized. Because when, when resources are needed, particularly on human resources are needed to, to supplement this, this became a stumbling block for, for the NSED as well as the proponent agency. The second would be social statistics. Of course, you would have provincial level, human development index, gender related development index. And just more recently, uh, in partnership with the UNICEF, we produced the first ever provincial level um, estimates of child development index. And of course, some statistics on middle income and hunger. And lastly, for some multi-sectoral statistics, the subnational monitoring of the, of the MDG indicators, good governance index, and measures of well-being or progress of societies, which uh, the NSCB has started to get involved in as early as 2007, particularly in the estimation of the Philippine Happiness Index and the statistical indicators on Philippine development, which is used as a statistical framework to monitor the achievements of the Philippine development program. So basically, we annually, we annually present the status of the targets of the PDP through this, whether it is being achieved or not, through the statistical Philippines or the statistical indicators of the Philippine development. So to focus mainly on the small area estimates of poverty, as I've mentioned, there are two areas, sectoral and geographical disaggregation. Let me focus first on basic sectors. Um, I think this was uh, with with increasing demand for for more information on poverty statistics, particularly for the basic sectors, and with the social reform agenda act, uh, wherein they specified 14 disadvantaged disadvantaged sectors of the society. The PSS through the NCB regularly computes official poverty statistics for nine of the basic sectors, particularly we have for women, youth children, senior citizens, individuals rise, residing in urban areas, which is actually a proxy for our urban poor as we, as currently the data, we cannot uh, produce these numbers on urban poor, and the migrant and formal sector workers, self-employed and unpaid family workers as a proxy to our informal sector, and the farmers and fishermen. So basically now, statistics available is for 2003, 2006, and 2009. The next slide just gives you a general idea how we are doing this. Basically, we are using the data from the Family Income Expenditure Survey and the Labor Force Survey, wherein while well, the FIES provides you household information on the income, on the income and expenditure aspect, the Labor Force Survey would somehow enrich and supplement the information from all the household members within that household so that we are now able to get um, sectoral characteristics of the poverty situation within the household, within the province, or within the region and the country. So just to give you some figures uh, on the latest poverty statistics for basic, for basic sectors, 
What I'm showing here is based on the computed poverty incidence, wherein it shows that fishermen, farmers, and the children comprise the poorest three sectors in 2009. And I would like to note that across these sectors, these are definitely not mutually exclusive. Well, so basically, there will be some overlaps, for example, with children and those who are women, etc. But, but looking at separately for each groups, these three sectors comprise the poorest in terms of poverty incidence. But of course, we also say that in terms of poverty, we do not only look at proportions because sometimes um, we, it is also equally important to look at the magnitude or the level or the number of the poor population. So because sometimes the, denom uh, the denominator dilutes the information that could have been obtained if magnitude has been shown. So basically, what we're showing here now is while children pose it as the third uh, poorest in terms of poverty incidence, children comprises the largest number for population at 12.4 million in 2009, followed by women for 11.2 million and 5.7 million for individuals residing in urban areas. So second, after the basic sectors, I mentioned that we have efforts for geographical level, uh, more uh, at the lower levels of disaggregation, at geographic levels. So basically, before 2003, poverty statistics released by the NSDB is only at the national and regional level. And we always say that who is actually using regional level poverty statistics? Are the regional administrators who will usually use this for actual policy uses, for for targeting or for program uh, implementation. So basically the challenge before 2003 then was to have more disaggregated levels of poverty. Hence, starting with 2003, the Philippine statistical system now has national, regional, and provincial level poverty statistics. This was actually pushed first by the uh, Department of Social Welfare and Development when they needed to identify the poorest 44 provinces for the implementation of their Kalahi Seeds program. So hence, uh, of course, there will be some, some issues as to the measures of precision, knowing that you are now going to lower levels of disaggregation, lower levels of disaggregation, but balancing the relevance of these estimates and the data constraints, I think um, the Philippine statistical system decided to come up with provincial level to be more relevant to our users. And then after the 2005, after we reached the 2003, of course, there will always be continuous demand. And then after the 2003, after the pro provincial, now there's that demand for city municipal level poverty statistics. So in 2005, the NSCB released uh, for the first time city and municipal level poverty estimates using small area estimation technique. Actually, again, uh, one of the major uses of this is the, it was used as a reference in the implementation of the CCT program by the Department of Social Welfare and Development. And we're also informed that with the latest updates, they will also use this as a reference or as a validation tool when they now update the NHTSPR or the National Household Targeting System for Poverty Reduction come 2013. So just to give you a summary, the NSCD has already released uh, 2000, 2003, and 2009 small area estimates of poverty with funding assistance from uh, the World Bank and with the uh, OSAID. Now, right now, actually we skipped first 2006 because we had to do 2006 and 2009. And in discussions within the NSCD, we were thinking that we have to prioritize first the 2009, which will be more relevant for for the SWD come your updating activity. And the 2006, we have to do later simply because it will just be really for trend analysis or for comparative purposes. Hence, uh, when we released the 2009 small area estimates in July of 2012, uh, we are scheduled to release the 2006 small area estimates in January next year. So basically, what we did here if before for sectoral, we were using the merged FIES and the merged um, LFS, we now added the use of the census of population and housing. So basically what we're doing here is borrowing strength 
from the from the very disaggregated census. So basically, from the FIS, you have income data, but you cannot go down at the city municipal level. From the census, you have city municipal level estimates, but you don't have income data. So merging all these files together, you are now able to come up with a model so that you can have a model-based estimate of income in your census. So basically, that's the idea of the small area estimation technique for us to come up with city and municipal level. So the, actually, the, the advantage or the benefit of doing such an exercise, despite it being computationally taxing, is the wealth of information that can be obtained now that you have city municipal level. Like, for example, here at your left side, you only have provincial uh, poverty maps at the provincial level. You can see here the colors where you can see where are the severe poverty situation vis-a-vis -vis their other neighboring provinces. But when you now do small area estimates, these colors can be more further disaggregated. You can have further, further information as to within one province, which is the poorest municipality, which is the poorest um, city, so that from, from your monitoring, from your targeting, your interventions, you can better prioritize areas within provinces. So I think that's one of the greatest benefits of having city municipal level poverty estimates. So just to give you some information or highlights on what we are able to produce from these data sets, uh, CI Land in Zamboanga del Norte was found to be the poorest municipality in 2009, wherein 80 of 100 individuals are poor, 8 out of 10 are, per, are poor compared to the national poverty incidence of 26 to 27 out of 100 individuals. And CIN actually continues to be the poorest. When we did the 2003 SAE exercise, it was the poorest municipality. And still for 2009, when you monitor the progress, it's still the, the poorest municipality. When you look at the poorest cities in 2009, Bingo City of Misamis Oriental uh, posted as the poorest city in 2009, having a poverty incidence of 48.7%. Or half of, of its population living in that city is poor. So the... This table just presents you the list of municipalities or cities that are deemed poorest in their respective regions. So the list for municipalities. But just to just before I show to you the list for municipalities, this is often a mis uh, or I think a misinterpretation or a miscommunication with with when we make a presentation of this list for that it is always confused as the richest or or no, it's basically we're saying actually that these are least poor areas but in terms of their poverty incidence they would only have the lowest poverty incidence but we are definitely not saying that these are rich areas there are still poor population in these areas they are just classified as least poor relative to the number or proportion of poor in other municipalities and cities so to present you the least for municipalities, it's actually in San Pedro, Laguna, which posted as the least for municipality in 2009. Actually, mainly are from Region 40, the nearest, the, the, at least in terms of municipalities, those near the NCR. But some cities, in terms of least for cities, we have to be known though. Binondo, Manila retains its position as the least poor city in 2009, where only one out of 100 individuals is considered poor. That's in Binondo. And you can see, in terms of representation, we are, are hearing whispers, why is Binondo the least poor? And then you're hearing, there are many Chinese in Binondo. There are many businessmen. So, so in so in terms of in terms of the grouping of this of this list for cities, you can find all of the cities coming from NCR with one coming from Region 4A, the Santa Rosa City in Laguna. And then of course we just have here a summary of the list for cities and municipalities by region for monitor monitoring or evaluation purposes based on your specific needs. So again, 
So of course, when we, when we monitor poverty, we do not only, we're often faced with questions. So now you have the least poor, the poorest, but really what happens between two periods in time? Whether it, there is really a significant increase or a significant decrease in terms of poverty, in terms of their poverty situation. So what we did, as I mentioned before, we don't have 2006 yet. We are still to produce it next year in January. So what we have is 2003 and 2009. What we did is to have a test of significant differences. Between, when we, when we got the differences in these two poverty incidences, we tested for their significant differences. And we only limited the cities and municipalities to those with significant differences. Those who are said to be, there is statistical sufficient uh, evidence to prove that indeed there is an increase or a decrease. So basically what we're saying here, um, nationally the municipality with the highest reduction in poverty from 2003 to 2009 was Lina Pakan in Palawan, where the number of poor individuals per 100 was reduced by 58. Um, compared with an increase of less than one per 100 individuals at the national level. Among the cities, the highest reduction in poverty from 2003 to 2009 was achieved in Calbayog City in summer, uh, with a reduction of 28 poor individuals per 100. So again, this just presents to you the summary per region for your just in case you want to, to know for each region which had the highest reduction in poverty. So now, after presenting to you small, focusing on small area estimates of poverty, let me go to some policy or program implications. If you want to further analyze it uh, for more evidence-based policy making and decision making. So we are often asked, when we present city and, uh, city and municipal level poverty estimates, we are sometimes asked by the audience, does it pay to be a CT? To answer that question, what we did internally is that we group, we group all cities all together as if they're one group, and group all municipalities all together as if they're one group, and computed for their poverty incidence. And what we got is, on the average, poverty incidence in cities is lower by 22 and 18 percentage points in 2003 and 2009, respectively compared with the municipalities. So again, there's a big disparity where, uh, in terms of poverty situation, uh, at least in, in the urban areas represented by cities as well as in municipalities. Second, we have here um, poverty and CPC areas covered by UNICEF. Do the numbers match? Um, our friend here, Hamad Masood, provided us with some information on the latest results of the 2012 multiple indicator survey uh, supported by UNICEF and conducted by the National Statistics Office. That survey actually covered 21 CPC areas from uh, 21 municipalities um, covered by UNICEF. So that's Camarines North, at least for the province, Masbate, Eastern Samar, Northern Samar, Sambuanga del Norte, Sambuanga del Sur, and North Cotabato. So what we wanted to do here is now that we have information on poverty at the city and municipal level, that's only income poverty. And we always say that, you know, when we talk of poverty, it's a multi-dimensional arena altogether. So hence, we have to um, match this, you have to match this income poverty information or features that we have. Thank you. So what we did here, after using the wealth of information from the MIS 2012 survey, uh, what we did is to match the, the 2009 poverty statistics, city municipal level, for, this, for these areas with the other non-income indicators of poverty. This is to help somehow give us indication whether do the numbers match in terms of income poverty as well as the non-income poverty dimension in these areas. And what we have seen here, actually for this particular exercise, we only focus on CIN, which is the poorest municipality. This can definitely be replicated to the other 20 municipalities from that, from that database. But for purposes of this presentation, I focus now on CIN, which is the poorest municipality in 2009. And when we look at water and sanitation, 
for the next two slides. Um, CIN also had the lowest percentage of improved sources of drinking water among CPC areas covered by the UNICEF in 2012. And in terms of sanitation, only about six of 10 individuals use improved sanitation, posting fifth lowest among CPC areas. And in terms of nutrition, in CIN, only three of 10 children received foods from four or more food groups registering second lowest and none were given because the, the dash here as put noted in the table indicates that there is zero or no observation for that. None were given multiple micronutrient powders in 2012 for this poorest municipality. So the next would be on education. CIN uh, it, is the least performing municipality among CPC areas in 2012 in terms of proportion of population aged 12, 12 to 24 years who completed elementary with only 4 out of 10 males completing elementary and 5 out of 10 females completing elementary. And in terms of literacy, of the 21 municipalities covered by UNICEF, CIN ranked poorly on basic literacy rate of children 6 to 11 years. That's only 76.8 ranking second lowest in terms of literacy rate. So basically, I think the numbers tell us that, you know, these are for income poverty in 2009. And what has the situation been in 2012 now, three years after, three years after, and then in terms of at least their non-income characteristics. And of course, I think these kinds of information will at least point to us um, um, information that can help us for more evidence-based and um, interventions, more evidence-based targeting us to where we can really come in if we really want our poorest areas to be helped. And then third, for the poverty, and this time for poverty and local governance, government finance. Um, from the Department of Budget and Management, they have the Bureau of Local Government Finance. And we appreciate the, no, uh, sorry, Department of Finance, uh, the BLGF. And we are thankful for the information provided to us as to the expenditures and income by the LGUs. So what we did is to match the poorest municipalities in terms of their incomes and expenditures. And four of the 10 poorest municipalities in 2009 also have poor rankings. At least they are in the, in the bottom, or the higher your rank is in terms of numbers or order, uh, the, the lower your total operating income and total uh, operating expenditures. And I think that's most evident with Buklo, Sanangani and Gutalak, Gutalak and Godot, yes. So again, but generally, correspondingly, the least poor would have better rankings in terms of operating income and operating expenditures. When we focus mainly on expenditures on education and health, we can see that in terms of the municipalities, three of the poorest 10 municipalities would also have poor rankings in terms of their expenditure on education. And four of the ten poorest municipalities would have uh, poor rankings in terms of their expenditures on health. And of course, correspondingly, for the least poor municipalities, we would have better rankings for expenditures on health and education. And when we look at cities, the numbers are higher, with seven of the ten poorest cities having uh, poor rankings in terms of government expenditures on education, and five of the ten poorest cities would have poor rankings in terms of government expenditures on health. And correspondingly, the least poor would have better rankings, at least for all of them in the poorest, in the least poor 10. So fourth would be the poverty and unemployment underemployment arena. Uh, there is, there is uh, indeed there's a need for quality employment. Poverty incidents, I'm showing here, poverty incidents among the employed, poverty incidents among the unemployed. And and more recently we actually it's still in my note. That we have just computed poor for the underemployed. For the employed we have twenty two percent in two thousand six and two thousand nine. If you're employed the poverty incidence is within that range. The unemployed would have lower poverty incidence. And if we actually show you the underemployed, for two thousand six it's thirty three point five for 2009, it's 35.4 for those underemployed. 
So actually, this table just shows you that employment actually is not sufficient. It is the quality of employment that matters. If we, if we really want to to help in alleviating poverty. And then next would be the poverty and minimum wage setting. Actually, what we did here, we did just some special computational exercises. Uh, we have poverty threshold. We have an a per capita poverty threshold. And then we have the minimum wage setting. What, uh, based on this, um, the required monthly income of a family size of four would be this one. And if you're a monthly income, earner if, if you're if you're one this is a monthly income of a minimum wage earner so basically we're just saying that if you're a minimum wage earner in for in Darada and you're the sole breadwinner and the average you will you will be non poor if your average family size is poor but beyond percent but poverty incidence went up so basically what we're saying here is that in region 4b um, the increase in economic growth between 06 and 09 is well distributed across all income decile class. As you can see, from the bottom decile to the to the top decile, there is an equitable increase in income. However, in Region 12, where poverty in well, well, there is economic growth, poverty incidence increase. When you look at income decile groups, you can see that growth in income is actually more felt in the top decile class or the top 30%. So hence, when we always say that when there's growth that is being reported also by NSCB and poverty incidents also being reported by NSCB and the numbers sometimes do not match, it is also important to look at the uh, story behind in terms of the income distribution. As in terms of poverty monitoring, we are really more concerned as to the tails or the bottom diesel groups, whether they're indeed getting the, the growth in incomes. And of course, poverty in terms of poor families would have bigger family size. On the average, the average family size is five. For all families, for the food poor or the poorest of the poor, the average family size is 6.5. For the poor, it's actually six. And for the non-poor, it's the lowest, which is 4.3. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, when we look at poverty, it's also important to look at sectoral representation. So, for my last slides, definitely there are many challenges and opportunities. Uh, for example, we are being asked to have regular generation of small area estimates of poverty, geographical and sectoral, regular generation of good governance indicators at the local level, convergence or maximized utilization of statistical information available at the local level, and of course, other measures of well-being, such as happiness of the poor, among others. Definitely, the list goes on and on. But to aid the Philippine statistical system in responding to these many demands and challenges, for us in the Philippine statistical system, uh, we should, of course, continuously undertake improvements in our work to ensure relevance and, to, and responsiveness to the demands of emerging concerns. Of course, more timely, more frequent, and lower levels of disaggregation for all this to be more relevant. And of course, in the actually in the in the PSS, we have to. I think we have to really strengthen the, our MNE efforts. Monitoring and evaluation system is actually now included in the Philippine Statistical Development Program 2011 to 2017. Now it is more evident, however, the greater challenge is really the implementation part. While the system is there, it's already included in the publication, but really, it should be a working plan, it should really be um, a delivering plan. And the provision of resources to implement this is very critical, to have the manpower and financial resources that comes with it. And of course, uh, we need definitely capacity building in terms of monitoring and evaluation. And for the local governments, as I focus on small area estimates, for the local governments to serve as key players in strengthening data support at smaller areas. That, you know, uh, LGUs especially, local chief executives, should s show a significant level of statistical appreciation, at least their support to invest on statistics, so that they can, they can help in coming up with more information for evidence-based targeting. And there is a need for statistical capacity building, uh, especially of the line agencies and the LGUs. Many local government units do not have, for example, statisticians or those uh, with um, sufficient training on statistics. Hence, 
capacity building is definitely needed. And lastly, for policy and decision makers to recognize and understand the importance of statistics and statistical system as a basic infrastructure towards development. We always say that when we talk to investments, it's not only just tangible investments on some projects or programs, but really the information behind before you can implement all these programs and projects, it should also really be included as part of the basic infrastructure on investment. Hence, um, uh, policy and decision makers must use statistics towards evidence-based decision making and must address the understanding for statistics and have the political will to really invest in statistics, on statisticians, on statistical um, offices for better development outcomes. Thank you and maraming salamat po.